So I actually got um, a few interesting questions um, during the discussion, which I think I might actually share um, since they mostly follow the previous section. Um, one of them was, uh, what about like automatic linting tools? Um, I didn't mention them because I, I presume mostly we run them, um, but we also run them. Uh, and we run them automatically. Um, let me just go back here. Oh, so far. So, um, nope, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. Oh, actually, this is a good example. Um, we have automatic t uh, tooling, uh, which is not linting-like. It's more like suggestion. It, it picks up code smells, which sometimes are fine, OK? So the signal-to-noise ratio may not be 100%. Um, one example in Python, if you catch an exception by, like, except exception, it's kind of discouraged. But in some cases, for system tooling, it's OK. Same thing in C++. Catching the true, like, top exception may not be the um, the best thing to do in most cases. Um, we actually don't use exceptions in C++, so uh, I don't really have a good example. But the idea is like, oh, templates, for example. Um, if you use template, um, we discourage that use. So it may be highlighted in the code review, kind of like this, but automatic tooling. In this case, it's actual reviewer who said something. Um, but it may actually be automatic tooling, which notice that, by the way, you created this object here. Uh, you might as well do an um move, because there's no, like, you don't use this reference to an object anymore. OK? Uh, we are currently. They're currently beta testing this software, so it's actually not uh, for everybody. So it runs automatically for you in reviews and helps um, sort of point out uh, easy fixes. And also it fixes it for you. So you can press a button, like you see buttons here. It has a box to fix me. So you just fix me, and it changes it for you automatically in the code review, which is kind of neat. Um, but the same thing with PyLint and um, C++ Lint and other linters um, and formatting tools. Uh, in fact, we also require your code to be formatted. You may format it by hand, if you choose to. Um, but it has to be formatted when you land. So um, one of those colorful buckets here, I mean, red means fail. Um, one of them is called pre-submit here. I don't see it immediately, but the pre-submit purpose is to test this kind of, not really run test, but check whether your code looks good formatted uh, correctly and so on. Um, so a bunch of such checks would be run there. It will also suggest you um, owners that I'm missing, like uh, people who, whom you also probably want to ask for review until you can land. Um, so all that is automated. Um, so that's one question. Uh, the other questions I'll actually cover in the, later on. So in this part, we discussed more from sort of what developer touches the most, the code, the code quality. Um, now we are talking about, oh, sorry, didn't go far enough. <laughs> um, so now we're talking about product quality. Um, basic goal is we don't want to ship code, which is bad, OK? Um, but I know some of you here are probably from the industry which does real-time software. I don't know, like uh, automotive, um, I don't know, airplane, some kind of uh, missile systems. Um, bugs, they are a bit costlier, OK? Uh, bugs in Chromium are slightly less costlier. So for m different sort of projects, you would have a different bar for what counts, um, like for how much you invest in the testing. Um, so the bigger the project, of course, the exponentially harder it is to test. Um, so that also, of course, creates uh, constraints. So Chromium does not do whatever it takes to avoid bugs. So we do reasonable things that, to avoid bugs. Uh, but we don't, um, we don't require 100% coverage, for example. Um, and yet we do require some things, so I will go through them. So the first and most um, usual problem that we have is, um, has been mentioned before, you passed all the tests before you committed. OK? And later on, you get an email, or maybe a bug report comes your way and says, like, hey, um, your change broke something. Um, but you don't always know whether it's actually your change. Right? If something is broken, it's not actually clear whether you broke it. Maybe somebody else broke it. Maybe somebody changed something else. Like, it, it's software world. There are lots of unknowns. Um, so how do, we make, how do we make sure the likelihood of this uncertainty is minimized? Um, that is important for developer productivity, um, because it's more likely they'll fix bugs. Um, one problem with achieving that easily is that uh, we have actually a huge commit rate. Um, if you can't see, this, this um, axis is how many commits per day do we have. Um, this is um, north of 300. So 300 commits per day. And you can see this week, anybody can guess what this week is? July 4th, that's the US holiday. Uh, most of our contributors from US. 
So um, these kind of low contribution rates, but um, Europe is still working uh, and Asia is still working. So lots of contributions and Canada is still working. So um, also the peak hours where like usually it's like lunchtime in every different like time zone. I mean, you know, there are no time zones in the middle Atlantic Ocean, but um, lots of developers. But like, so in Europe, there will be like around lunchtime, there'll be many more commits, presumably because people like press the commits, uh, like commit after all the tests pass and go eating. Makes sense. Um, so at times, um, we're going to reach like one commit every two minutes. Um, and remember, I mentioned that tests actually take some time to run. So if commits are landing every two minutes, there's no way we can test every single commit really individually. So it's, it's hard. Um, sometimes we have to test, as I mentioned before, we test um, on the leftmost column, we test five commits at once. Uh, if that thing becomes red, um, one of those five changes is bad, usually, <laughs> unless it's a flag. So um, kind of obvious solution, yeah, we, we, just, we just cannot test all of them, so we merge them. But um, remember that we also test each commit before it lands. But sometimes the order matters. Maybe you both modify the same file in different lines, so git didn't complain, no conflict. But it doesn't mean it compiles. It happens. Um, so as I mentioned, if A and B is bad, two changes, A plus B doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily good. Um, so there are many ways that could manifest itself. Compilation is one example, but also test failures and other kind of stuff. Um, do you know why it's really bad? Um, the biggest problem here is if A plus B is bad, so like some, some commits after this one, suppose, um, you cannot compile the project anymore. Uh, the biggest problem is that is if a developer checks out that code at that specific revision, and then developer hacks stuff, and then runs tests locally, and they fail, the developer may think it's my fault, uh, but it's not. And that's like basis productivity. Um, in practice, we cannot really... Um, Guarantee that there are no bad commits at the head. But our goal is to reduce the likelihood that if you sync your code with the, with the server, you get a shitty commit. Okay? So we try to minimize this probability. Uh, we do so through, of course, manually. We have somebody called sheriffs, which are people who are supposed to watch this, basically, this page. We have some limited tooling for them. Uh, but they have the right to essentially revert anything they want. Well, presumably for a reason. Uh, so if they see a commit which they kind of have a gut feeling probably caused the breakage. Uh, so as I mentioned, the example here is, see, this one is still being built, uh, but maybe something like inside is already visibly failing, uh, and a sheriff is uh, rotated, uh, sheriff is like a rotation. So um, every day there will be one or two sheriffs out of committers. Uh, those sheriffs allow three word changes as, as they see fit in order to keep the state of the repository while well, building and uh, testing. So the other thing, of course, we have automated tooling um, which bisects potential um, commits to blame and finds thematically who is to blame. Unfortunately, it takes some time until it can figure out who is actually the culprit. It doesn't want to have false positive because people hate when their uh, commits are reverted by a system uh, by mistake. So, so it doesn't do it. Um, it only does it if it's really certain. So that's, that's it how we try to solve this problem. Um, remember I mentioned in the beginning, there are no real panacea here. Um, there's no perfect solution here. We don't want to limit developers' productivity. We don't want to tell everybody, wait 10 minutes until next commit lands. We don't want to do that uh, because it's impractical with our commit rate. Um, so we, we try to find the right balance. All right, um, next problem. Probably you're all familiar with, kind of fun problem. Oh, yes. So essentially, <coughs> Before, uh, before the build is not completed on like head, can people clone that kind of can people clone coming or like two different other like two different repositories one that you pull from the other that you push to? Yeah. Um, so uh, the question was. Um, presume there is a bad change coming in. Okay. Um, we haven't finished running all the tests on it yet. Um, can people actually check it out? A and the answer is yes, they can. Um, is my mic still working? All right. So, um, so yes, people can check out a bad change. Uh, there is a reason for that. We have a single, uh, we have a single uh, server. Well, I mean, clearly it's replicated in a bunch of like uh, distributed processing there. But essentially, for from developer perspective, there's a single uh, upstream with which the developer syncs. Uh, sometimes tests run for more than an hour, depending on on the tests. We try to reduce that. I'll talk a bit later. Uh, but my point is, we're not going to wait for one hour. 
uh, until the test finished. So yes, developer can check out uh, a bad revision. However, um, just go back a bit. Um, remember that we have a bunch of these configurations, right? Like a huge, huge number of columns. Um, we have sort of, again, most important configurations. Uh, we check them and we kind of keep track. Um, if all of those configurations sort of agree uh, up to some commit, then we have a special ref, git ref, like a special branch, uh, which we update to uh, last common good revision or last common compiled revision. Um, it has been really used before when our head was like eternally broken. Um, but I think our, our life, like uh, thanks to Automated System for pre-commit testing, um, I think most developers don't do it anymore. So uh, they um, usually check out, like um, they come in the morning, they check out uh, a commit, or like they, they sync their, refresh their checkout in the morning and they probably don't sync it until they really need to. Um, and usually that's fine. So I think productivity loss from bad head um, has been minimized lately. Um, I don't actually exactly know the number, <laughs> but I don't see many complaints in the mailing list and the bug report. So I, I, I think it's fine. Um, any other questions? Yeah, so some tests you run before the merge and some after, is that right? Uh, sorry? Do you run all the tests pre-merge? Um, all right, so the, I will just answer directly. Uh, we, do not, we do not run all the tests pre-merge because it's too expansive, okay. uh, because so we don't have hardware. Do you run some of them pre-merge? Yeah, sure. So pre-merge, we run some tests, um, as I mentioned before, mm -hmm. um, which is supposed to cover, which is supposed to catch most of the of the mistakes. And how do you determine how much of those tests you run, or which test? Uh, if you have a new test, how do you determine whether you want to run a pre-merge or post-merge? Is there like a hard time line, a time gap where all the tests have to be in, or is there a hard amount of tests that needs to be executed before the merge? Okay, so that's a really good question. The question is, um, if a developer say adds a new test. Uh, how do we determine whether we run it before, or whether we run it before? We always run it afterwards, but do we run it before commit, uh, before merging the commit? Um, basically, we don't actually determine it on a test by test basis um, because it's like too small to count. And I will mention before in the future like why it matters to us not that much. Um, but if you want to add like a test suite or say a performance testing, which will take say 20 minutes. Um, that requires to go through like approval so that we have enough hardware for this new thing if we count it uh, worthwhile. Uh, generally, the most important metric is SNR, signal to noise ratio. So basically, how likely is your test to fail and how many times of those it's a true failure that is actionable. Right? So you, you, if a test fails, if the test is flaking, you know, just goes random uh, out of one and then compares it to 0 0.5. Like, it will fail 50% of the time. Okay, it fails, um, but it's not actionable. Developer cannot do anything. He actually should dis disable the test completely if, if that such test is noticed. Um, so SNR is important, signal to noise ratio, and that's how we determine whether we run it or not. Like basically, how likely it is that um, this test will actually, if it fails, it will show a genuine problem. Um, and the other, of course, constraint is: do we have enough hardware? So, for example, Android KitKat is kind of outdated, yet many people use it, uh, but it's outdated and it's hard to buy new devices which run KitKat. Uh, so we usually buy a bunch of them and then they die. All of them, that's it. We cannot test KitKat anymore. Um, that happens. So then we have to remove KitKat from the pre-commit testing and only run it um, after. That, that's, how, that's how it works. Uh, mind me, um, the, this is, I'm talking about like Google side testing. I'm, I'm pretty sure Opera does their own testing because they're based in Chromium. Um, I don't know how they test. Um, all right, you're gonna test. So um, this is probably fun for C++ people. Uh, if you ever coded something which is like templates, heavy templates, if you use catch unit test framework, anybody? Okay, um, I like it, but man, it takes so long to compile. Um, it's all header, it's like one giant header, it's kind of nice, because you can include one include and it just works and magic, um, but it takes forever. And I have a pretty good machine. So compile time has been an eternal problem. It has been a problem with Google since like 2000. Um, Google tried to solve it through many different ways. Chromium essentially adopted it most of those ways, and not only Google, but like outside companies, whatever people created. Um, so traditional solutions, don't put stuff in header files. We all know that, probably, I hope. <laughs> well, if not, once you get into the big project, you'll probably figure out. Um, the other one is incremental com compilation. Um, now, this is kind of nice thing in theory, right? So like, if you already compiled something, like, I don't know, 10,000 targets, and you change one CPP file, you want to recompile just one object, right? And then run linker. 
Um, in practice, lots of uh, compilers and tool chains are buggy. And if you do this, Linker will just produce some garbage which may work or maybe not work for no fault of your own. So if you basically do make clean frequently, probably you have such a tool chain. <laughs> we used to have such a tool chain. We have dedicated C++ teams, including in this office, who are trying to improve tool chains, so this does not happen. Uh, I think we don't do make clean frequently anymore. But yeah, it still happens. Sometimes you have to do it. Uh, usually because of some very nasty C++ change somebody made that um, usually macro something. Um, so you have to be, it, it, it's hard. But incremental compilation is actually what we practice and for all our tests which run pre-commit without incremental compilation, you would wait not for one hour, but for like three, four hours, depending on what you touch. Uh, I know somebody touched one header file which was used literally everywhere. If you heard of Google logging library, um, they changed the header, I think they waited for six hours. But I will mention how we try to help them. So another thing which we do is, uh, actually developers are more expensive than machines. Um, maybe you've seen that. Um, this is MacBook Pro, uh, sorry, Mac Pro if you haven't seen it. Uh, and this is Z804, Z840 or something, HP. Anyway, basically like dual core CPU Xeon with as many cores as you can buy. Um, I think it costs like five or six thousand dollars each. Um, it's really worth the money, okay? Um, you don't want developer to wait for compile 10 minutes if you can wait only one minute, okay? If you count how many times developer recompiles something, this probably, depending on how expensive developer is and how expensive real estate is, this pays out within months, I'm pretty sure even in Munich. Um, so, it's a good investment. Um, of course, SSD, without this, life is miserable. It's just miserable. So don't do that. Uh, the other thing we do is faster linker. Linker is, you probably realize the Chrome has lots of object files. Linker takes forever. Maybe you heard of gold. Um, I think it's Google creation, not for Chrome, uh, but Chrome was a major beneficiary. Uh, LVM is LED, we're trying to migrate to that, I think, but it's not all easy. Um, remember also we are multi-platform. So we have true story anecdote on Mac. Um, Mac minis have a limit on how much RAM you can stick there. Um, the problem is Mac minis, we have to link on them and it, somebody would add a change which would require Linker to use more than, uh, I think, seven something GB, and it's at fault because of no memory. <laughs> and so then you revert the change. Change is not bad, it's just like adds like stupid function somewhere, okay? For some reason that, record, that makes Linker go overboard. Um, that was a huge problem. Um, basically it was organic growth, nobody cared until it started running out of memory because AGB is the limit. So we had to upgrade everything to uh, Mac Pros, I mean the compiling machines, um, huge project but sort of very unexpected. But this is the kind of problems that we are facing. Um, so fast linker. Um, of course, finally, this is Google. Uh, we don't like waiting for a single machine. Uh, we have a sticker on our laptops called, my other computer is a data center. That's essentially this. Um, so if you export CXX, you know what CXX is? as um, an environment variable which says what's your C++ compiler. Um, you say Goma, not exactly, but kind of like that. Um, if you have credentials to use it, uh, you can like run 10, 1,000 uh, compile, uh, compilations uh, in parallel. Uh, mind me, not linking, just compilations. It sends back you the huge object files from your C++ headers plus CPP. So that's how it works, unfortunately only for Googlers today, but we know there's huge interest. Um, we have an open source client, but it's not yet fully working. Uh, if you are a company which has C++ and scale, you may want to stay tuned. <laughs> Here's the link. Um, the caveat here is that because C++ uses, it thought it was a great idea to reuse C with all its macro. We know the stuff that you define and so on. Um, because of that crap, where you include from really matters. So if you include, for example, in Linux, your star lib includes something x86 or 64 Linux something, and you change that pass, com compiler may actually produce a different output. Reason because the order of imports, the resolution for the same names would be different slightly, and if you have a project with like thousands of header files, it's extremely difficult to say what happened. Okay, so, Caveat, if you want to hit, if you want to take advantage of this thing, you take advantage of the caching so that um, you don't recompile the same thing twice. You have to really have the same file system structure, which is un unfortunate. Um, but that's C++. Thank you, C++. Modules. 
Yes. Oh, okay. So I, have, I, I hear somebody calls it modules. Yes, we are working on modules. Um, once we get them cross-platform, we'll be users. Um, we'll take a while, I think, until the compiler is ready. But we're investing heavily in, that te in those teams, too. All right. Um, so let's go next. The other thing which bothered us is, particularly in commandal compile, uh, is makefile. Um, our makefile has, as you can imagine, quite a few targets. Uh, even though make is written, I think, in C, didn't help. Still super slow. Uh, it, what it does with file system is actually even worse. Um, it's like super buggy. Uh, and the biggest problem is that there are different versions for make on different platforms. Some of them are buggy and some are not, uh, which is really hard. So at some point, somebody got just fed up with this crap and um, he just coded Ninja. He called it because he liked Ninjas, I don't know. Um, he basically just wrote in C++ a much faster version of make. It's much more dumber. Uh, it doesn't support fancy syntax that I always make with typos in. Uh, but that's what it is. Uh, I'm pretty sure many of you use Ninja, right? Okay, I see some head nodding. So that's really thanks to Chromium. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. Um, so we now use Ninja everywhere, and uh, it has sped up compile times. I think like you save at least a minute uh, on our automatic uh, machines, which run tests for you. Um, I don't know about individual developers. All right. So that's it for compilation time. That's these are our solutions. Did I mention that not use templates help? <laughs> I'm so sad about that. All right, let's go next. Um, since I mentioned Ninja, as you can understand, we have we support multiple platforms. Uh, clearly, there's no point compiling POSIX for Windows. Like, you don't want to compile those files. Uh, but as I mentioned, we keep all those files in the same repository. So we need conditional compilation, or most importantly, conditional make file generation, or Ninja file generation. So we call it GN. Small historical note. Um, we actually tried to use different things uh, over the years of Chromium. Uh, internally at Google, there is a different thing. Uh, now there's also something called Basel, which is, I think, open source version of what Google used to have. Um, it still has. Um, maybe, if we are lucky, in a few years, like five, we will migrate to Basel if it supports all our fancy use cases. Um, but Chromium had to write its own. Uh, there were a bunch of things. We used Escons. Anybody heard of that? It's Python. It's awesome. You can write anything. Problem. You have to maintain all that shit. <laughs> we still do Fanacle. Uh, maybe not anymore. Anyway, so uh, the newest generation where we realized our mistakes, we call it GN, which is like rewrite from scratch after what, what we learned. Uh, and it's really a meta build system. So you tell it the parameters, like you want to build Asan build with extra checks um, for Windows 32. And it decides, it generates a Ninja file with the right defines and so on, uh, and the right includes. So that's really what it does. But it has very, um, so it's similar to CMake, and maybe we would have used CMake if CMake had cap capacity for uh, like multi-platform like back when we, had, when we needed it. So I don't know. Now we have GN. So um, we, essentially it maps source to targets and it knows the conditions. Right, so it knows everything about the source and it knows which targets the source belongs to and um, depending on different conditions. Uh, Really like CMake in that sense. Uh, most important feature is this. You can ask GN, hey GN, I changed this file. What am I affecting? Um, so if you change some, I don't know, header file or C++ file, it can tell you that you will affect, for example, browser unit tests and, I don't know, boring SSL, open SSL fork uh, unit tests. Uh, what that, uh, the advantage of that is you can, you, you can avoid rerunning tests which you, wouldn't, which you don't affect. Uh, which is a huge productivity gain. Yes, please. Does it only tell you about platforms where this task will have to be executed or affected? I believe so, but I'm not sure. Uh, here's the link for more documentation, and you can read it. Um, note, we're actually re reworking documentation because we're trying to put GN outside of Chromium um, to make it more usable for other platforms. Um, so it may be a bit in flux. Maybe check out after a month. But we are friendly. We have mailing lists. You can ask us there. Uh, I am more creator of GN, so not the best person to answer that. Um, all right, let's go next. Finally, tests. Tests take a long time to run. Um, integration tests uh, are, of course, worst. Uh, but even unit tests, if you have thousands of them and, you know, like set up, tear down, it takes a while. Um, so worst thing is we like to have test coverage. So it means more tests, more runtime. And I already mentioned we, use, we used to use BuildBot. We still do, but we try not to. And BuildBot has an idea that you have like one worker which does everything. You give it a set of things to do and it does that thing for you. Um, suppose you want to compile it for Mac. We have 
I think uh, three or four hours of tests to run for, for, for just a single Mac config. Um, you don't want to wait for four hours, right? Um, note that compile actually takes, I think, 20 minutes now with the parallelization and so on. So you basically wait 20 minutes for compile and four hours running tests, which is really bad. Um, so um, as I mentioned before, we ask GN. GN, can I skip running tests if this change clearly didn't affect it? Uh, note, this is only pre-commit before you land your commit in the master branch. Because once you land in the master branch, we want to test everything. Uh, but before, we can we try to speed up the feedback for the developer. So GN is nice, <laughs> not enough. Um, you know, what we do at Google, we parallelize stuff on different machines. Um, the interesting bit here is this. Um, if you compile Chromium in debug mode, it has quite a bit of symbols. And those symbols are gigabytes of symbols. Um, even though we hate, we, we try to avoid templates, it's still gigabytes of symbols. Um, and even just the binary itself is pretty huge. So if you, if you build on one single machine, um, how do you send all these gigabytes of test binaries and artifacts to testing machines? Um, I know people tried to use BitTorrent kind of ideas before. Um, uh, we too, I think, experimented with that. But the um, solution um, comes from a simple observation is that um, sometimes binaries, test binaries don't change. And sometimes, uh, particularly if you imagine, we have many uh, commits or pre-commits being tested at the same time. Okay, so like many people working at the same time, so they uploaded their uh, patch and they want to test it before they land it. And so it is possible that uh, two different patches will actually produce the same artifact they end up with the same binary. So um, that allows us to avoid sending data over the network that actually is already there at destination. So basically caching works. Um, so we cache by something called CAS, uh, which is really a content addressed storage. So um, we call it isolate server because it isolates whatever is necessary for the test. So if you think about machine which compiles, it needs a bunch of stuff. It needs all the source files, all the tooling and so on. Um, but when you test, you don't need all that tooling. All you need is just like basically test binary and maybe a few like data files on which run tests. So isolate means that it asks well the special um, build files that describe uh, what is necessary, which files need to be isolated in order to run the test. Um, so isolate essentially just for simplicity, we have like two different unit test binaries. Okay, so this has a bunch of unit tests and this has a bunch of unit tests, and so you just execute them. Um, Instead of, instead of executing them directly on the same machine that compiled it, we first isolate them. And we isolate them through a very, very dumb system. It just computes a hash uh, of the file and asks the server, hey, server, do you have hash A, B, C, D, E, F, G? And the server says, yes, I do. Well, you save yourself from one gigabyte of data over network. Um, and then similarly, the testers receive the hashes, not the binaries, they receive the hashes from the compiler. And those hashes basically say, well, here's the binary identified by this hash. Run it. And of course, as I mentioned, these ones are uh, like unit test binaries, but they have a bunch of unit tests in them, like thousands. So we would shard them. So a bunch of workers would get the first binary, and they would get a shard number. So they basically run every seventh test, for example. And the other one runs like every six, whatever, like module seven. Anyway, so that's how sharding works. Yes, question. Well, as far as I remember, I don't think if you compile the same thing from the same source over and over, they will produce different binaries. Great question. Just hold it. <laughs> I'm going to cover it. Is it okay? Um, any other questions? Okay. Yes. You also have cloud uh, store uh, cache for the compiling step as well. So you mean for object files? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of not really the same thing. Yeah, it's also. Uh, um, Let me just, um, so, um, yeah. is that the one? so the question was, what about the compile uh, thing? Yes, so that's actually here, oh, wait, where was that? Yeah, this one. Uh, I mentioned here um, Goma, or the distributed compiling. It has caching on the backend side. Uh, we also have a small cache of object files locally, but hit rate is not that high, unfortunately. Um, only basically incremental part is what matters the most, unfortunately, locally. But on the server side, if the inputs are the same, and remember I mentioned paths are the same, it will actually not recompile the same thing. So it also hashes all the inputs 
all the header files, all the paths, including in them, hashes all of them. If the hash is the same, it treats the um, output as the same. So yeah, it's also content-based hash. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, all right, so we go back here. So as I mentioned, the workers get only the files they need. As a result, each worker downloads, I think on average, less than 500 megabytes. Uh, just basically the, the binary that actually usually changes. Um, which essentially allows us to, oh, and also each worker has a cache too. So if a test depends on a bunch of data files, we have a test called um, WebKit test. You may have heard of WebKit. That's what we forked into something called Blink and then we merged it into Chrome because one repo is better. Uh, Blink has a huge number of tests which are more like integration tests, which basically gives the HTML file a bunch of JavaScript and says, how does it look? Gives it like a few seconds and then asks, well, so how does it look? And then compares. Uh, and those tests require a gazillion of uh, HTML files. Most of those HTML files don't change within uh, like even a day. So as a result, the cache hit rate on, on these workers is huge. Um, but that's how it works. So now, let me come back here uh, for interesting question that I received. It's true that compile is not deterministic in general. Right? Um, people who wrote compilers thought it was a great idea to include a timestamp. I mean, isn't it nice? It's useful, uh, which totally breaks our purpose. Uh, so we actually work hard uh, to try to make them deterministic. Uh, in fact, we have special uh, tests which run continuously trying to ensure that they're deterministic so we can catch the regression. Uh, we also have people working on tooling who try to make them deterministic. Um, I think actually we had them fully deterministic on Linux and Mac for a while. I think it still isn't Linux. Probably not ever on Windows, though sometimes we get lucky. I mean, we removed all the timestamps, but there's still sometimes the order of the object files which be inserted somehow, and the linker may choose somehow random order. Um, still, given how many people compile, um, actually cache hit, cache hit rate is actually pretty high, um, which I find very surprising. Um, another thing here is, actually, since you know the hash of the test that you're running, if you run it already, you don't run it again. Um, which also saves the time, right? I mean, if it's the same hash, the same things you're running, there's no point rerunning it again. Well, unless it's flaky, <laughs> in which case we will run it. But if it's like all, all passed, we don't run it again. All right, um, that's all for the tests. Uh, more details here. Um, this is not a Chromium specific, I mean, the framework which we use. Um, so you could use it for your projects, but I mean, it's not easy to get into. Uh, that's actually. I specifically work on a team which works in this kind of low-level stuff uh, and distributed systems, uh, which underpin the efficiency of this sharing. So you can ask me more questions specifically about this stuff. I actually know more. Yes, please. Can you in some way ensure that the build environment on the test machines is the same, like running Docker or something like um, that? So the question was, do we ensure that the build environment and developer workstation is the same as on our testing, um, I mean, actual fleet of testing machines? Well, we try. Uh, we, we really try to... Um, to, to make it as hermetic as possible. Um, Docker doesn't work because we have Linux and Mac. Oh, sorry, Windows and Mac. Uh, so we would like to use Docker, but it's not sufficient. Uh, Chrome OS, on the other hand, because it's pure Linux, they can afford to use even Docker, um, though they started before Docker, so they use ch root with some custom stuff, which is kind of Docker, really. Um, anyway, so they actually do that. Um, but for Chromium, it's not easy. Uh, we really hope eventually to be a totally hermetic environment, so you can run exactly the same thing on developer workstation. All right, um, I'm going to go fast now, um, so I cover more releases, because I was a bit slow. So releases, um, essentially, there's always a trade-off. You want to release on schedule, or you really, really, really want to squeeze this feature, I mean, just one more day, and I will land everything. And um, we choose the predictable releases. So if your team wants to release something, they know the schedule. Uh, I think this Thursday there will be a cut of a new branch. If you don't make it by Thursday, too bad. You wait another six weeks. We do releases to actual like branches, which will become uh, releases every six weeks. Um, so somebody asked before, we do Canary daily. Um, thanks to continuous testing after every commit, um, chances are it actually works. I mean, just like we can actually cut it um, the usual way. Uh, I think we actually create three or four sort of candidates for Canary. And then we choose the latest successful one, something like this. Um, and then um, it goes to Chromium Dev, um, which there stays, I think, for like six weeks. Then that thing becomes beta. And then finally, it goes to production. Uh, the upside is, oops, sorry. 
Uh, we maintain only, uh, well, there is dev, which is basically like master branch, um, or very close to master branch, like bleeding head. Um, and then we have two more beta and, and stable. So we only maintain three versions. So we don't have IE6, if you know what it is. Internet Explorer 6, which was stuck in Windows XP for a long time. So we don't have such a state. We, like, Chrome really <laughs> works hard to open update itself, like a malware. Um, but primarily because for most users it's a good thing, because if they don't update, they'll get all kind of zero days accumulated, so they'll be hacked next time they go and do internet banking or something. Um, so that's basically the, our goal. Uh, make sure everybody's updated. All right. Um, so which brings me to something that people maybe care a bit. Um, what kind of branching structure do we have? And uh, you may be expecting some cool diagrams with stuff, but there's none of that. First of all, I was lazy. And second thing is actually really, really simple. Um, but before I go there, really let's try to think why we chose the structure we chose. And we chose it because of these sort of three concerns that just illustrate what we really want. Um, we want to answer questions like, did my feature or my commit made it to this release? Which you know by name. Um, maybe the, can you, can a uh, release manager answer whether this zero, um, zero day vulnerability has been fixed and landed in this cannery that he can promote to a uh, release? And finally, if you see elevated crash rate, like more people experience crashes after this new release, uh, can you attribute it to a specific set of commits which might have caused it? Um, turns out all these questions could be answered if you just maintain, as I mentioned, two branches. And I really mean branches here, git branches. Um, we required all bug fixes first go to master branch, which may be a bit controversial to some people, but if you want to have a bug fix, Suppose like you know there's a regression on some release we just made, which is you know 12 weeks behind master. Um, you still have to first fix it on master, and then you cherry pick it onto well whatever branch you need to cherry pick it on, and then automatic builders will pick it up and create the release with that fix. Uh, the importance of that is that master is usually the best version. It always contains everything. Um, so as I said, I mentioned all new and also all bug fixes on master. Now, sometimes people like to experiment, like they want to like, create a dirty thing, just land all kind of stuff in there. Um, we allow that, but you won't have easy time sticking into master. Uh, yes, please. So, um, so do you follow the same strategy for new features as well, like someone introduced a crazy feature? And do you also do that for the release? Uh, <coughs> so um, the question was, do we follow the same thing for new features? So the experimental branches here is, is for more like really, really experiments. Like, just want to see, can we try HTTPS 2.0 or 3.0 just for the fun? Can, is it easy to, in, to make it into Chrome? Um, that's really the only use case. If you really want to write a new feature, like you really intend to, you write it onto master. We do not allow for you to create like 10 commits on a, your feature branch locally. Um, just bring those 10 commits and just dumping them onto master. That's forbidden. I mean, if the reviewer can review those 10,000 lines diff, Sure, but you will spend probably one month reviewing that stuff. Okay, so generally, you know, the smaller the review size, uh, the faster you get feedback from the reviewer. So it's strongly discouraged that you develop like something on your own and then come back with a dump. And unfortunately, we have unfortunately many students uh, who do some really cool stuff in the university or like research projects, like improving battery usage and so on. And then they come to us like, hey, this branch 48 from two years ago. Uh, I made this really cool improvement. Like. 100% better or something. That's it. I mean, we cannot do anything with it. Like, it's, thank you, but it's your work. Like, we, it's too expensive, really, to, to move it to the newer version. So if you want to contribute, you should ideally tell us in advance what you want to do. You know, talk to the people who will be owners, who will be reviewing your stuff. Um, and, you know, do a commit after commit directly into master. Um, that's how it works. All right. Um, I don't have much time left, so let me go to the next problem. Um, this is fun, it's extremely common. Um, how do you know that your commit is inside the release branch? Remember that we do cherry picks, right? So you first land something in master, and then you cherry pick into release, and then you know some actual code will compile the ship to a user. How do you know that whatever user has, it actually contains your feature? So, I mean, clearly, um, before I go here, clearly you can just go to a special server which tells you, okay, release one to three, uh, is hash a, b, c, d, e, f, g. Then you go to that hash of git log, then you try to find where in that git log whether it contains a commit or not, which requires some manual operation. And most importantly, it requires 
cognitive overhead. Like you really have to think about it hard because hashes are kind of hard to compare in your head. Right? If I tell you FFFEF and ABCDE, you don't know which one comes first. Um, that's the necessity of Git. Otherwise, it wouldn't be distributed. Um, but it's a downside for cognitive overload of developers. So we do a horrible thing if you are a Git lover. We assign numbers, like you know, decimal numbers, OK? Um, if you like Git, like if you know the internals of Git, something will irk inside you, like, ooh. Uh, it happens to me. I coded this. Um, felt bad. But people like it, <laughs> OK? So here's how it works. Um, if you use Gavit, you're probably familiar with the kind of footers. Uh, also, I think Git adopted the same footers. Um, there's a special line here, which is automatically added onto every commit, which basically says, my position, CR means Chrome. <laughs> Um, we're not very creative. Uh, it basically says I'm on master ref and my positional number is 575,000 commits. Okay? And that means the next one will be 575567. And that's how it works. And the upside is if you want to answer the question, so is my commit there? You can just look at the number, maybe, I don't know, 999, and your commit is 785. So it's immediately obvious, yes, it isn't in there. Um, and so it's much easier for humans. Uh, it turns out it's also extremely much easier for people who write tooling to compare integers um, than go to git history and go through it. And so we will have to live with this. Um, but that's how it works. Uh, interesting bit here is if you do cherry pick from the master branch onto release branch, we record that in history. So here's the original one where you cherry picked it from. And here's where you cherry picked it to. And it also has its own position. Um, and that's how you can see if your commit made it to a, a release branch. Um, all this is automated. It's a great plugin I wrote. Um, so as I said, upside is humans are really good at comparing numbers <laughs> and not hashes. Um, and another interesting bit is um, for master branch, all positions are essentially unique. Right? So if you have a, a number, a six-digit number um, today, uh, that uniquely identifies a commit. And so for, many of our, for most of our tooling, not all, you can specify that number instead of a hash. That will give you some information. So they're kind of interchangeable. Um, the downside is, and that's really why Git doesn't do it, is you need a central server to add these unique numbers. But because we have a unique server, that's our Garrett server, um, and it's open source, and so we can contribute to it as a plugin, we can afford to do this. Um, so all of this thing is open source. <laughs> you can use it. Um, I, I laugh because I kind of still feel bad about this usage because it's contrary to Git. But for a big project, um, it, I think it's a worthwhile thing. All right. Um, the last few slides here is um, third-party stuff. For example, we use SQLite. It's an awesome, well-tested uh, database local thing. We use that. We use LevelDB. Wrote for Chromium. Now we use much, lots of places. Uh, how do we stick it into Chrome? Well, basically, there are two strategies. Um, remember I mentioned that you don't want to have multiple repos? Okay, but the, if the, develop, if the uh, third party thing changes very frequently, for example, V8, okay, it changes very frequently. Like, there's a V8 team here in Munich, they commit every day. Um, they actually have their own repository. So then we do something called um, pinning or, well, making a dependency. So really think of it Git sub module if you use that. Okay, so um, we say, well, Chromium at this revision, this special file, uh, like git, dot git modules and git sub modules, we have what we call depths. Oh, sorry, not here. Um, where we say we depend on V8 to be checked out in this folder at this revision. Um, that's really what it does. That's, that's number one. The downside is if V8 changes, you have to change this pin, right? You have to keep updating which version of V8 you depend on. Um, that's the downside. And of course, remember that this is all different repositories in Git, they would come with history. So if V8, that's like 300 megabytes of history. So if you add something like this, it means everybody will have to pay 300 megabytes additionally. So sometimes we try to push back, um, particularly for things which don't change frequently or very small or history which we don't care. Um, like Chisima log, for example, would be such an example. Uh, we just copy paste the source at some specific revision uh, directly into our source code. We, of course, write down in the readme which revision it copied from, and so sometimes we may update it. Um, but basically, two approaches. Um, again, trade off. Um, because you have to remember to keep it up to date. Yes, question? Do you have any people who are responsible for updating the Yes, so again, owners exist. Um, SQLite, probably there's no owner. Like, whenever you need a new feature, then you're responsible for updating it. Uh, or if, some, if there's like a zero day vulnerability, then of course we fix it. Uh, there are people in rotation to do that. All right. 
Um, finally, last two bits. Um, I will. I, if you have any questions about this, you can ask me after the talk. I'm not sure if everybody is interested, but I can talk to it in detail. Uh, question is, if you somebody tells you gives you a bug report, and even tells you a revision from where it was built, remember we have a bunch of dependencies. Okay, um, how can you re really, really reproduce the same build? It's kind of related to um, hermetic workstation, like where it's exactly the same thing as the actual build environment. Um, goal is to be as close as possible. So, um, related one, solution, um, pin dependencies. Now, that might not be clear. When I was doing position, I, I didn't realize that. By pinning, I mean, when you declare a dependency, like Chromium depends on V8, you always say at which version. And that is encoded inside the repository itself. So every commit of Chromium has exact revision of V8 with which it is supposed to work. Okay? But not only repositories. Everything. You define on Git version, you go, you go Git version. You stick it in. Stick it in the dependencies. Um, you have a specific um, tooling, like specific version of Clan, uh, Clang, sorry, which we built, or a specific version of GN, or any other helper tool which contributes to build, like Linker. All of those are pinned. So what that means is, if you come back maybe half a year later, um, you can check out all like half a year old Chromium, um, run hooks to download all those dependencies, and you will hopefully have exactly the tools which we used to build Chromium at that specific revision. Well, unfortunately not every tool was built. For example, some system Linux libraries are not really inserted inside, and some, of course, Windows stuff. So it's not easy, but our goal is to be everyone. Um, again, very important to emphasize, we pin. We don't just declare dependency, but we pin a specific revision. So that means if they change their stuff, we are not broken until we try to update the pin. At which point, we will discover that something is not working, and then maybe we fix, or maybe we don't roll. But that's the idea. All right, uh, final words on open sourcing. I think people have some questions. Um, clearly, this perception that if you do open source, um, people like, commit, like contribute kind of crap. I mean, some people contribute crap, OK? Um, but if you have your own developers, you trust them, so they write only awesome code. They never cut corners, never deadlines. Um, However, this is probably true, a faster velocity, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a big company and you have like some you know, time that you've been in business, you usually have lots of tooling which you find useful, um, which you can't usually use unless you open source it fully. So this is a kind of trade-off, but let me show you how uh, it works with Chromium. So we kind of work around shitty code being contributed to us through code review and linting automatic tools and automatic reverts. Um, the problem is, because that extra work required to review contributors' code, it's not really free. Right, if somebody sends me a, uh, um, a patch, I have to review it. That's my time. It's not free, but it's nice. Um, the other thing is increases trust. For us, it's important. We want you to, well, if you want, you can go and check Chromium, all its source code, uh, and see whether we really spy on you. We don't, um, but you can actually check it. Okay? Um, to us, it's important. Um, finally, um, the downside for us is that if we depend, if we want to use some kind of internal code, and we started using internal code because, well, we developed internally at first, uh, we couldn't just open source that. Um, so it required some rewriting basic libraries. So that's the downside. All right. Um, finally, I will leave you with the number one productivity tool. Huh? <laughs> you kind of close, but not exactly. Now, if that Google is in, in this, uh, or those who've been at Google, uh, please uh, keep your hands down. Um, anybody wants to guess other than Google? Sorry? Go. Well, okay. The search. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm also a Firefox user, so um, I don't mind if you like to go. Uh, but I'm not talking about search engine, or at least not the typical search engine. Um, I don't think so. Well, at least. Um, this is based on the service which we conduct the Chromium developers. Um, it's actually something which looks like this. Um, it's basically something we call code search. It's a bit like Google, except when you search code, it searches it semantically, understanding Java, C++, Python, whatever, whatever stuff you're using. Um, and it used to be actually public service which Google offered. I think it stopped offering in like 2009 or something. I don't remember why I wasn't at Google. Um, it's actually extremely useful productive tool. Uh, particularly for a big repository, because you don't know who is using it. Doing it locally takes huge time. Even if you do Git grab and even in parallel, it still takes a long time. Now, this thing is awesome. And it can easily cross boundaries of repositories while Git grab does not. And you don't even need to check out code. And I think now we have a small prototype where you can actually, you can see something, you can click, see those tooling out there? We have now an edit button, so you can click edit and change something right from there without using um, actual machine, but still in 
beta. Um, and I already showed you on the very right hand side layers of blame list. Um, so you can do code archaeology, you can see who wrote that WTF. All right, um, I think this is number one uh, productivity tool, definitely is for me, uh, particularly when I work in a huge code base. In a small code base, not so important, but for a huge one, uh, which I don't know very well, this is awesome. Um, now I know this is currently, uh, so for Chromium, this, this tool is public. So you, I'm, I'm actually giving you a screenshot of public tool. You can go to cs.chromium.org. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't work for your project, right? But we are having open source effort called Kais.io. Uh, check it out. I think it's, we're already using it in, internally, I think at least. Um, so maybe you can use it uh, for your own company if you have big source code. Um, so with this, uh, let me conclude. What's the goal of all this thing? By the way, good book, recommend. Um, is it really maximizing data productivity? Or enforcing release timetable? Or avoiding all the bugs, regressions, whatever? Um, I don't think so. Um, you can actually try to optimize all of those and you end up with this building, real thing. If you haven't been there, check it out. The O2 is building, not Photoshopped. It's an old station next to Olympia Park. Um, my point here is, just because you can improve developer productivity at making this awesome tool, doesn't mean you actually achieve the goal. Our goal isn't just developer productivity or releases. Our goal is, well, depending on what your goal of your company is, ours is to uh, ship good stuff to the user. Okay? Um, that means when we approach developer productivity, it's, sorry, when we approach infrastructure, it's, we can't be focused on just one thing. Okay? Um, ultimately, to me, it's really this ancient Greek trade-off thingy from Athens, I think. Um, at most times, you have to balance. You can make developer go much faster and then commit many more bugs. Um, and you saw it throughout the whole presentation. There are lots of trade-offs that we have to take. Uh, they're very painful trade-offs because as a developer, I kind of like to move faster. Um, but essentially, that's most of the work is about. Um, we don't, shouldn't forget costs and of course user satisfaction. Uh, with this, I think the infrastructure is really not just about tooling, um, but it's also about the cultural processes. So the analogy here is you can of course lay very nice concrete in our asphalt road, um, but it's really not sufficient. You also need the rules, the signage, the kind of uh, processes with which people who use this tooling uh, can actually peacefully and productively cooperate with each other. Um, with this, if you have any questions, you will be able to ask them after the end because I think I'm out of time. Um, here are the bunch of links, uh, which of course you don't have to click right now because, all right, reminder, this is my personal opinion. Okay, I'm, I'm here on vacation. Um, many people will disagree with me. Um, so don't hold my uh, employer or any other employer accountable. Um, with this, uh, here's a QR code. If you have a phone, um, if you give me feedback, I would really appreciate. Um, link to the talk. You can also see it from feedback. And uh, finally, if you want to talk to me, um, you can write me an email. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention.